Hello, everybody. I actually did, when I looked at this before, I was thinking, I actually almost like I've actually created a title that is a, like a scientific thing, but it's not really meant to be. It's just meant to be a headline. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm Andre Dutman. Some of you might know me better for crunching your bones and hurting you when you've had bad backs in the past. Uh, in the last few years, I've also started working with men. Uh, and this is some of my story about exactly what I do and where I've been. So in the last five years, uh, I think five years ago, so 2011, people would probably have looked at me. Uh, and from the outside, they'd have thought, hey, Andre got a pretty successful life. I was married, I had a lovely supportive wife, uh, a very lovely daughter, a job that was very rewarding for me. I had my own health practice, as I still do. And uh, yeah, life seemed perfect and, and very happy. And probably most people would think that I was doing pretty well. The reverse was actually true. In many ways, I was OK, but I was also struggling quite a lot to uh, really connect with some of the deeper stuff that was going on in my life. Uh, I was sort of drinking probably way too much. I was not particularly healthy, uh, and I was struggling at home and in my marriage. Um, anyway, so part of the reason why I've come up to this, <laughs> this is good, actually, because this is part of the uh, whole process of letting men bring stuff out. So part of this, when I did my speech to Lynn, my wife, the other day, a lot of this emotion came up as well. And I thought, well, that's probably not going to happen on the day, so it'll be fine. <laughs> and sure enough, it does. But anyway, so part of what I want to speak to you about today, as I've spent some of my time... Oh, my timer is still at 18 minutes, Mark. That's good. <laughs> yes, I get more minutes. Uh, yeah, so part of what I want to speak to you today is why I feel that we have a society we are really letting our boys down and our teenagers. And it's all our fault. We have a situation where our boys are becoming more and more withdrawn, where they're becoming really difficult to speak up about their emotions, where they're becoming very, very closed, where they're afraid to tell their own truths. Part of this is down to absent role models, absent male role models in our lives. So particularly in one instance, absent fathers. Divorce rates, as we talked about before, are rising. 42% of marriages in the UK will end in divorce. 25% of UK households are bringing up children alone. And there's a massive overworking problem with 86% of people in a recent survey, working longer than the designated hours, which means that both mothers and fathers are not really present for their children. Also, in an education perspective, um, for example, my daughter uh, goes to a primary school over here, and there is not one male teacher in that school. Now, whilst the, don't get me wrong for a second, well, the, the, the teaching is fantastic. My daughter's had a wonderful education, and it's a fantastic, supportive, inclusive school. But for boys that are brought up at home without fathers uh, and without male teachers, they get to 11 years old and they really have never had strong male mentorship. And I think this is a big issue. And whereas boys move into their teenage years, it doesn't get a lot easier. As I say here, in the last 25 years, the rates of teenage anxiety and depression have risen by 70%. And since 2009, the number of teenage psychiatric cases have doubled in their admitting to A&E hospitals, um, as has the rate of eating disorders in terms of uh, presenting to the GP's clinics. <clears throat> and as we move from teenager into men, the situation doesn't get any better. As Patrick mentioned earlier on, the UK uh, su suicide rates are rising. The highest rate of suicide for any uh, group is not in teenage boys and girls, as some people might have thought, but it's actually for men between 45 and 49. For a man aged between, and this is the same, again, same fact that Patrick gave us, for a man aged between 20 and 45, suicide is actually the most common way of dying, more than heart disease, road traffic accidents, cancer, or any sort of chronic disease. But what if it didn't have to be this way? What if we lived in a world where boys were brought up to be emotionally literate and develop emotional intelligence? What if we lived in a world where teenagers had the support and guidance necessary to move them through to adulthood? And what if we lived in a world where in 2030, every 45-year-old man felt safe, secure and supported enough that not one of them committed suicide? So, this is a lovely comment. <laughs> I should explain in some detail. My, uh, I got my first hater on social media recently. 
uh, I posted something about how <clears throat> my, um, I've been doing thousands of hours of self-development, or not thousands, but hundreds of hours of self-development over the years and how it had been quite tough, but I'd learned a lot of stuff. And this guy posted on Facebook and he said, on my own development, are you a fucking toaster or what? Cop on, get a grip and just live. If this is not patently obvious to you, then you're lost. So stop wanking about and go for a ride. <laughs> so, a couple of things I'll pull him up on. Probably the fact that a toaster, I'm not sure that a toaster, I don't know any bread-related appliances that actually have done that many thousands of hours of self-development work, but maybe I'm wrong, or maybe someone can show me this very intelligent uh, toaster that I would like to meet him. But also, I think any, any man sitting here today can probably relate to a little bit of that. The fact that men are very quick to discuss and to abuse and to put down other men and boys. Um, and it happens in the playground, it happens from a very, very early age. Boys learn to hide their own truths. They learn to withdraw and they learn to really pull back from really engaging with other men around them, other boys around them. Was that from Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is, actually, yes. It was Donald Trump. And luckily, uh, I didn't meet him in a corridor, so I didn't get a grope from him, which is always good. <laughs> or, maybe, or maybe I did. <laughs> this is actually why I'm crying, because Donald Trump groped me in a corridor. Uh, so a very well-renowned Harvard professor, Judy Chu, um, did some really amazing work on looking at child development. She noted that when boys were four and five years old, they actually had an amazing ability to read other children's, other people's emotions. Uh, they could, um, they could empathise with other people's uh, emotions as well, and they could read what was going on exactly the same way that the four and five year old girls could. But once they got to about six years old, they started to become more aggressive, and they started to sort of start to posture a little bit and adapt much more masculine sort of uh, behaviour in, in, in an apparent effort to fit in with their other classmates. And by the time they got to ten years of age. The boys had become, in Judy Chu's word, emotionally stoic and self-sufficient. Now, this was a tragedy because, actually, as another researcher in Neota Wei uh, noted, um, the actual progression of boys into teenage years, the teenage friendships that form for 12- and 13-year-old boys are massively important for support and guidance and real transition through into the later teenage years. However, what actually happens is, by the time the boys get to 15 or 16, they start to close off from these friendships. They start to think that it might be seen as being soft or gay to have close friendships. And uh, Neota Wei actually did interviews with hundreds of children at this age group and found that whilst every single one of them wanted to have close male friendships, not a single one had actually gone forward to another boy to approach them to have this friendship in case they were rejected or humiliated. And that's a real tragedy. In fact, as she referred to it, she, in the other way, refers to it as, this is not just a teenage boy communication problem. This is a human crisis of connection. And I think this is very true. And as boys develop older, and they become, you know, from out of teenage years and into uh, adulthood, I think this crisis of connection makes, is, becomes even worse. So... This is the role of the mentor, which can really stop this from happening. I think if any of you were at Thrive last year, you'll remember a memorable talk by Michael Boyle, who talked about uh, the role of mentors, and he talked about the mentorship programs that he was running in, in the south of England, along with, other, uh, with lots of other men. Um, they were providing really strong support and guidance for teenage boys and giving them mentors to work with them. And this is such, a, such an important life, um, such, such, such an important role. Teenage boys need a lot more help than we actually think they do. The problem is with this is that they tend to close up. They tend to, when they're in distress, they tend to sort of lock themselves into their own worlds. And then they'll lash out with violence towards themselves and others. Um, so it's actually quite difficult to get into at this stage. But if we start to train people, if we start to train our boys to be more open to this stuff and start to train you know, guys in our communities to actually start making a difference with these lads, it will make such a difference. And as, hopefully, these boys become more rounded and more uh, functional, they'll move into the next stage of life again, being even more, um, yeah, developed, I guess. Because one of the problems that I see, and one of the problems that was definitely part of my issue, was actually that this family unit is becoming more and more the way that we live. 
we've lost our tribal uh, sense. We've lost the communication and the, and the connection with men outside of our society. And we live in these very, very small family units, which puts an incredible pressure on to these marriages. Um, men generally need more support. You know, we're asking our partners to be so much more uh, than just wives to us. From my own experience, uh, in 2010, 2011, I remember I was having an argument with my wife, Lynn. And it was probably about something that I wasn't taking full responsibility for in my life at that time, I suspect. And she turned to me and she said, sometimes you just want far too much from me. And it was like something fell from my eyes. I really suddenly realised that I was asking way too much for her, that I was asking so much more than she should be expected to, to give me. Um, and so I started to look outside and I started to think, what do I really want from life? And I thought, well, yeah, I do need a lover to, to you know, whisper to under the sheets. But I also need more than that. I need a wise counsel to hear my deepest thoughts. I need a healer to start moving me through my trauma. I need a peer to assess myself against. I need a mentor to aspire to. I need a trickster friend that I can go out and get into mischief with occasionally. And I need a teacher that I can learn about my deeper reasonings from. Unfortunately, all of these things are falling onto our wives rather than onto our rounded friends because we are losing connection with these people. You know, we're living in very, very small family units and this is just getting lost. So this, although there's a spelling mistake in there, as I realised yesterday, uh, this is a really lovely quote to move me on to the next part of my talk, which is about trauma, because this is the one thing that is not being covered as well as possible, I think, in men's development. Now, the quote is, there are wounds that never show on the body that are deeper and more hurtful than anything that bleeds. And I think this is really, really true when it comes to trauma. Now, my background is in working with people in health. And when I deal with people who we talk about trauma, they'll all quite often say, well, you know, trauma really doesn't really happen to me. I've never had anything really bad happen to me. And I say, well, that's true. And of course it is. There's so many people around the world that have had far, far more greater stress and trauma than any lucky of us probably most of us that are sitting here today. But it doesn't mean that we're still not affected by stress and trauma in our own lives. Um, and I like to reframe the way of, rather than talking about traumatic experiences with my clients, I talk about undigested life experiences, which is actually a way that the body, things happen to us and the body takes them into the in, inside and it just keeps stuck in there and doesn't really ever get filtered through. Um, the, the, and the way this really works is probably worth speaking about the stress response of the human uh, experience. As you're all probably familiar, the fight or flight syndrome is a, um, is a part of our sort of our makeup that actually allows us to uh, escape and to run away. Um, and I won't bore you with any neuroanatomy, but I'll give you a little bit of an idea about what happens when something frightening happens to us. So something comes into my experience and I get, immediately get flooded with adrenaline. It pulses, it, it increases my heart rate, increases my breathing rate, all the blood runs to my muscles and it, and it enables me to either run away or to fight for my life. Now, this is all fine and in an instant, it's a very, very quick response. But when this lasts a little bit longer, what happens is cortisol gets released into the system. Now, cortisol is really meant for us to be able to get to a point of safety. So it's meant for us to, you know, maybe a few hours, a few days at the most, to enable us to get to a point where we can move into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest stage of life. Now, this is a very important part for us to actually be able to process our wounds, to be able to deal with the trauma we've gone through, and to be able to you know, be with loved ones and, and pass this through. Unfortunately, in modern life, lots of trauma, but also lots of ongoing stresses from just living. So we end up getting long-term cortisol dis disorders, particularly in our children. And this is a bad thing. It leads to brain disruption and organ dysfunction, as I said there. So there's something else with trauma. In uh, 1980s, I think it was, Dr. Vincent Folletti was working in a San Diego clinic, and he realised that um, a weight loss clinic, that all these people that he was working with had uh, dropped out of the weight loss program, and he was thinking, Why is, what's this happening? What's going on? He, worked, he did an interview with 286 people, and he realised that so many of them had actually gone back to eating again after losing all this weight because they had suffered childhood trauma. Now, the Centre of Disease Control got involved and with this research and found it really interesting. They actually interviewed a further 17,000 people from this clinic, 
And over the next 10 years, they worked out that 70% of these people had had some form of childhood trauma. Now, this included physical and emotional uh, neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse, but also divorce and um, apparent alcohol and substance abuse. So they formed this idea of the adverse childhood experiences. And actually, what they came to find out was that one in three children in the United States and also in the United Kingdom have suffered at least one of these adverse childhood experiences. And if they've suffered one, there's 87, 87% of those children have suffered more than one. Now, this again leads to long-term stress, and it leads to the body really not knowing how to deal with this. So when you put this all together, you get a situation where we actually have a fairly difficult situation for our children. Um, because what happens is that we have this, these processes, these chemicals rushing through our body, these stress chemicals are always with us, always present, and we're rarely getting to the point where we can really digest with this stuff and really work it through. So a great guy came along called Bessel van der Kock. He wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score in the last couple of years, and he was a PTSD researcher, post-traumatic stress disorder, and he found that actually, uh, after 30 years of working with people who have been suffering from trauma, that the traditional therapies such as medication and, um, and long-term sort of uh, psychotherapy were really not getting the results that he wanted. So he started to go deeper into, into some alternative therapies. And what he came up with was the concept of top-down and bottom-up therapies, two ways of working with stress and trauma with the body. So top-down were things like mindfulness and meditation, the idea is that you work with the cortex, the, with the brain, and, and allow sort of feelings of, of, of uh, release and, and, and you know, stress relief and all that sort of stuff to filter down through the rest of the body, giving the, the user a feeling of, of relief from the stress and trauma. Bottom up was more around breath work and more around um, touch and somatic therapy, enabling the the user to feel the sensations of, of change through the body, which would in turn change the top. Now, in my last two minutes and 48 seconds, what I see is a real opportunity for change, for us to be able to start working with our boys in a much deeper way. Granted, we might have to change the concept, some of the ways we deal with the concepts of doing yoga or mindfulness or meditation for our, or breath work for our young people, because obviously Teenage boys, maybe not going to be so open to that, but at the same stage, if we can, we are really opening our young people to a huge amount of change um, and healthy potential benefits. So these are the guys. <laughs> these are the three ways we can start to work with, the, work with these processes. So to sum it all up, really, in my last two minutes, I would say that when you put everything together, that I've just talked about, I see a world of possibility as, long, as well as a world that is not functioning so well now. There is a huge potential for change. Because what if we could help our teens deal with this stress? What if we could really get them into their bodies and start to really feel their emotions at a deeper level? Because I believe this is possible. I believe it is possible that we could live a world where our boys grew up in an environment where they felt free to express their emotions and where they felt free to do so without fear of abuse. I believe in a world where our boys and our teenagers could voice their opinions without getting shouted down by others. And I believe in a world where there would be several brave lads in every community that would stand up and support their friends because the more people join in, the more people will grow and this movement will grow of supporting our lads to go better and stronger. And I believe massively in the sense of teenager being supported through uh, their next development into men by having strong support networks and guidance to really help their healthy development. Because once these guys become teenagers and become healthy, mature adults, they will make for better fathers. They will make for better husbands and partners. And they will make for better friends and mentors for those boys around them that need the help. And as we change the circle, so everything will change and move forward and upwards. Thank you for your time. <laughs>